I'm Dr. Andy Willemot, and I'm a lecturer in modern Russian and Soviet history. I'm going to talk to you today about the Russian Revolution and the Bolshevik Revolution, and the beginning of the first avowedly socialist state in history. This event that caused the end of the Tsar and the end of the Tsarist rule, the end of 300 years of the House of Romanov and Romanov rule. And to understand all of this and to understand the social chaos, the social and cultural disorder that led to revolution, we need to go back to the First World War. We need to understand what it was about the First World War that initiated all this distrust in the government. Now, the First World War, Russia enters it initially with some confidence. It, there are many generals saying that the war will be over by Christmas. And we need to only look at the diaries of General Brusilov to realise how dangerous this confidence was. In the first seven months of war, Russia ordered an extra 41 rifles to be made, scarcely enough. They thought that they could get through the war effort based on the armaments they already had. He also noticed that the officer class was ill-trained and ill-prepared for war, and that there were poor telecommunications within the army networks. He also noted that their communications were not encrypted, so that when they were intercepted, the Germans could easily outflank them in, on the field. Um, furthermore, we need to look at the economy to understand what this did to Russia and to its society. First of all, Russia enters the war against Germany. Germany is Russia's biggest exporting market, so we lose our biggest exporting partnership off the bat. We also lose access to Scandinavia, and this is another key area for trade. Also, perhaps understandably, as you enter war, you want a nice sober nation. So we introduce prohibition. The problem is, in Russia, that the revenue, uh, the tax revenue from vodka accounts for up to 25% of the state's income. So we really are shooting ourselves in the foot here. We are reducing our income at a time that we actually need to invest in mobilization for war. And this leads to a number of problems because what resources there are are directed for the war effort to the front to feed the men. And this makes goods at home in the domestic front scarce, leading to social tensions back at home. So with all this happening and with uh, Russia's mobilization and war effort becoming pro increasingly problematic, on the 22nd of August when Tsar Nic of, of 1915, when Tsar Nicholas takes over the army, putting himself at the head of the command, what he does is he establishes himself as the figurehead of a failing effort. He only discredits himself further. He discredits himself and he di discredits the very institution of Tsarism. And so from this point on, we see that old sacrosanct image of the Tsar eroding, eroding further. It was first questioned in the 1905 revolution, but now we see it only a few years later in, in the First World War, we see it questioned again and uh, further disrupt, disruption and, and anger fermenting. Furthermore, by going to the front and attempting to, to lead the army, the Tsar leaves a power vacuum back at home in the capital, Petrograd, as it's called at that point, formerly St. Petersburg, named Petrograd, it sounds less German. And in that power vacuum, you have the Tsarina, the Tsar's wife. And the closest, the easiest way to get to power is seen to be to bend the air on the Tsarina. And what happens during this period is you have a huge turnover in the number of ministers. And so the very government at home is less stable. Uh, to give you some, some figures on this, during this war effort period, we have four min prime ministers, five ministers of the interior, three foreign ministers, and four ministers of agriculture. There's a constant turnover of ministers in key positions, creating greater and greater instability. So by 1916, indeed November 1916, you have Milyukov ma making a speech known as the stupidity or treason speech. This is a speech where he details the problems of Russia's governing and governance of the war, its war effort. And he talks about all the problems that, that is, has occurred, and it talks about all the problems uh, and failures of the government. And punctuating each paragraph of his speech, he ends with, is this stupidity or treason? It's interesting to note here that treason, 
is no longer being spoken about and being raised as some sort of act against the Tsar, against the monarch. It is an act against Mother Russia, arguably against the people who are suffering. Again, you can see how the dynamics have, shif dynamics have shifted here quite considerably. So let's jump into February. Now we know the beginning of the revolution is the February Revolution. At the very start of, of 1917 in January, the police are conducting uh, observations of society, writing up reports, and they're pressing uh, the Tsar to, to act. Their reports say that there uh, is growing social unrest day on day. And they actually make references back to 1905, the, the first Russian revolution. And it, this was a failed revolution, but it becomes a marker against which all other protests, discontent uh, can be measured. And they say it's getting worse than 1905. It's happening again. We don't know what's happening. So here are these police reports, normally quite measured, dull um, affairs, uh, quite boring language usually employed. Here they are, quite emotive, quite emotionally driven, asking for action, saying that we don't know where this is going to lead to. Uh, and indeed, there were a number of protests breaking out sporadically, especially on key anniversary dates, including the 9th of January, which was the anniversary of Bloody Sunday, which started off in 1905, when Tsarist troops shot dead hundreds of protesters on the street. But it was the 23rd of February, that is International Women's Day, that the women of the Vyborg district of Petrograd, this is the industrial region of Petrograd, they downed tools, refused to work, went out of the factory, banged on fact neighbouring factory doors and demanded that other factory workers join them, male colleagues and male workers come and join them. These women, their husbands and their sons were probably at the front, perpetuating the war effort. They were working probably 12-hour shifts. They were then, in the morning or in the evening, queuing up, desperate for food, rations of bread, queuing up for bread that was probably not in stock. They'd had enough, and so they lead these protests. And it's the next day, uh, as they march through to the centre of Petrograd, the bridges have been drawn up in an attempt to keep them from marching to the centre, but the river's frozen, so they can just march straight across the river. And they galvanise around key symbols of the Tsar estate, around statues of the Tsar, the old Tsars, things against which they can protest and direct their anger. This is often how revolutions and protests, which are quite chaotic affairs, find a point of organisation. It's around statues, central squares. By the 26th of February, the garrison troops who have been ordered um, to shoot down or to stop the protesters in their tracks start to yield to the protesters, start to yield to these revolutionaries. And there are reports that whole garrisons would yield to young children walking up to them with a bouquet of flowers or tying a red ribbon on the end of their bayonets. These symbols became the weapons of the protesters and the garrison troops refused to shoot their own, to refuse to shoot their brothers and sisters. Uh, so this is a key turning point. If you can't control your military forces properly, then you are in trouble, and the Tsar certainly is in trouble. A new language breaks out with these protests. Freedom, svobodna in Russian. Freedom, but also dignity. These are the words on the lips of, of these protesters. They're demanding freedom, they're demanding dignity, they're demanding bread, they're demanding to be fed. And in this chaos, we soon have pressure put on the Tsar to abdicate. And indeed, he does abdicate in early March. The protests are, are such that he can no longer continue. He expects that his brother will, will take the throne, but his brother is perhaps more sensible and sees where things are going and doesn't take the throne. And what we have then is what historians now call a system of dual power. You get a temporary government come in. It calls itself the provisional government. And this takes the higher echelons of government, governmental control. But at the same time, the Soviets are established to, and Soviets literally just means council in Russian, and the Soviets uh, establish themselves as representatives of the people. They demand to be able to speak for the people, the workers and the soldiers, and they agree to prop up the provisional government if they can get better rights for 
the people. It, it, if you want to think of an equivalent, I guess it's, it's like a revolution breaking out in Britain and a temporary government taking place or holding court in London and in all the councils of uh, London coming together to say we will support you if we can get better rights for the people. And indeed the Soviets did very quickly demand greater rights for workers, did demand greater respect for soldiers. Indeed one of the things that they demanded was that when soldiers were off duty they were seen as equals with officers and that it was only during service that they had to perform to the rigid hierarchies of the military. So as 1917 goes forward, th there are a number of key points that you will come across in, in your reading and your learning about this topic. Uh, one of which is uh, April and the April Thesis. What happens is Lenin comes back, comes into Finland station in Petrograd, and he sees what's happened. He sees that the Soviets have, are propping up this temporary provisional government. And he says, why? Why are we waiting? Why are we compromising? Let's seize power. This isn't the time to compromise. Now is the time to lead the revolution. Now is the time uh, to w establish a workers' government. So this is Lenin's April thesis. He demands all power to the Soviets. This is the key slogan, uh, meaning that we need to get rid of this provisional government. Other key events you'll hear about across 1917, the July days. These, this is a period when many Bolsheviks, armed Bolsheviks in fact, went to the streets, went back onto the streets, uh, apparently threatening to take power, to seize power, demanding that someone at least seize power. And the Bolsheviks, understandably, are blamed for this, and Lenin would have to go into hiding after this event. He would shave off his famous goatee and, uh, and dress as a, as a common worker and, and escape back to Finland. In fact, we now know, looking at, at the historical records, that this movement was probably promoted by Bolshevik sections and Bolshevik supporters within the garrisons, and that Lenin was actually quite sceptical uh, of their actions and their, their motives. So he wasn't quite leading this event, these events at this point, but he did get blamed for it. But the Bolsheviks wouldn't be in the doghouse for long. Come August, you'll have the Kornilov affair. General Kornilov, general of the Imperial Russian Army, would apparently threatened to seize or move to seize Petrograd and seize control of the revolution. And this threat, the threat that the Imperial Guards are coming back, means that the, there is greater support again on the streets for a more radical alternative. And you need to remember that throughout all of this, what the Bolsheviks have done, and what Lenin has done in particular, is they've remained untainted. The Bolsheviks are the only party that have said all the way through, we cannot compromise. We cannot work with the provisional government. So when Lenin finally comes back to Petrograd, he starts to help organise the planned seizure of power. And this happens in October. And this is what the October Revolution really is. You have a military, military revolutionary committee, the MRC established by the Bolsheviks, led by Trotsky. They seize control of the bridges on the evening of the 24th into the 25th of October. And they then also plan to seize the Winter Palace, where the provisional government are holed up, debating what to do. Uh, later accounts uh, by the Soviets made this seem like a very heroic event, and there was a film made in 1928 uh, about this event, and apparently more people were injured filming this film, this movie, than uh, were actually injured in the seizure of the Win Winter Palace itself. What actually happened is these people went into the Winter Palace and in, amidst all the thousands of, room of the, rooms of this great palace, they couldn't find the provisional government. It took them ages to find them. When they finally did, they could arrest and sack the government. And this is the beginning of Bolshevik power. From this moment on, Lenin, Trotsky and key Bolsheviks would seize control of the Soviets, gain a majority and establish a socialist government and a socialist program of events.